Welcome everyone to our U of M School for Environment and Sustainability lecture series, Justice Agendas for Confronting Environmental Crisis. This uh, series has been put together by collaborative efforts from faculty and students, uh, student leadership in our environmental justice field of specialization at the U of M School for Sustainability and Environment. And we are really excited about creating a lecture series that is both cutting edge and hard hitting, but informal and convivial, where we can be in better dialogue with one another, with our colleagues from other schools, and with members of our surrounding matrix, and indeed national and even international movements toward environmental justice and sustainability. Today's guest, Dr. Shakara Tyler, is so exciting for us because of precisely that kind of blend. And rather than introduce Dr. Tyler at length, I'm going to actually ask a colleague of mine, Joe Trumpy, to do that. And um, I'd like to let you all know the way our format works for these talks. We do record them for those who can't make it in the busy, busy teaching days that we have and learning days. But we will have both a faculty colleague introduce Dr. Tyler and then graduate students from our environmental justice certificate um, and study community offer short comments and reactions to Dr. Tyler's work and moderate our question and answer session. So things will move a little bit quickly and there is a very much a group conversation feel to this. I'd like to encourage folks to use the chat um, and or to raise your hands. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to use the formal question and answer feature. However, I do see some of you doing it and um, I will be monitoring myself, the Q&A, as well as the chat features as we go. I think today we may have some interactive components to the talk, so please would like to encourage you to respond in the chat to those. And I would like to also just let you know about a few features of our program today, which is that, for example, working with the students, we've decided on a couple of things. We have decided that we won't begin with a land acknowledgement about the ways in which um, tribal communities in Michigan were part of the origin of our university, but rather we'll put that at the end of the talk. We're experimenting with this. Our university is experimenting with this because we need to get better at acknowledging and respecting those relationships and indeed learning about them. But to do it at the start feels somewhat perfunctory. And so the students opted to wait until the end to reflect on those questions and to attempt to think about them in light of the content for today. So I'd like to respect that choice and I'll let you know that's coming at the end of the hour. I'll also just make a quick plug for our cross-campus certificate program in environmental justice, which runs with rolling admissions and which can be learned a lot more about by just contacting me, rdharden, at umich.edu. I am the coordinator of that certificate program and it is open to students from all across campus at the graduate level, master's or PhD, who would like to join our environmental justice community and earn an environmental justice certificate at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. With all of that said, let me introduce my colleague, Joe Trumpy, who teaches at our U of M School of Art and Design, but is also well known as a leader and educator through practice on his own off-grid, straw bale, spectacular home in Grass Lake, Michigan. And I thought that uh, Joe would make a fantastic person to introduce Dr. Tyler, both for his own teaching and research, but also for his union of practice of, I guess as uh, Drake would say, walking the talk, to introduce Dr. Tyler. Well, huge thanks to all of you for joining us. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. It's my pleasure. So, hey, well, food is so important. Uh, not only does it sustain us, it helps define us. Uh, learning to foster and facilitate its growth and share in its bounty is an important part of our humanity. And many of us are using farming as a stepping stone towards self-efficiency. This leads us to the doorstep of engaging deeper issues such as land access, uh, access to heritage seed stock, access to policymakers, access to capital, clean and reliable water and energy. Farming allows us to dig deeper into sustainability itself, regenerative practice and justice. Uh, the rewarding work of empathizing with plants and animals opens a door to deeper connections and understandings of care. Care for the soil, the water, the air, other living things, including our human brothers and sisters. It's a pathway to building strength and creativity, creative practice and leadership. 
Uh, for me, I love farming. I get lost thinking about the systems and the inter iterative design nature of it all. It provides me with a lot of room for thought while getting lost in the labor. It provides space for solace and healing, beauty and even joy. We have 30 lambs on the ground this over the past two weeks and boy, what a, what a challenge and, and beautiful thing that has been. Uh, it's a perfect space to nurture scholarship and leadership hand in hand to literally build a more inclusive, just and sustainable future. Well, we're lucky to hear from Dr. Shakara Tyler today, whose work melds farm practice, community engagement, and scholarship all together. Dr. Tyler is a returning generation farmer, educator, and activist scholar who engages in Black agrarianism, agroecology, food sovereignty, and climate justice as commitments of, of abolition and decolonization. She's committed to working with communities to explore the pedagogies of reconnecting to the land and using land-based acti activism as a tool in building community self-determination. Dr. Tyler earned her PhD at Michigan State University in community sustainability and works with black farming communities in Michigan and the Mid-Atlantic. She serves as board president of at the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. She's a board member of the Detroit, Pe 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 Detroit People's Food Co-op and is a member of the Black Dirt Farm Collective. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Dr. Tyler. Thank you, Joe, for that beautiful introduction. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks everyone for making space to join me here. And I'm hoping that we can learn with one another, hoping that this can be a vibrant conversation and less of a lecture of me sharing about what I know and or at least what I think I know. Um, and yeah, so please use the chat when you want throughout the presentation, not just at the end for Q&A. Um, I definitely prefer for this to be more of a horizontal knowledge exchange. Do I have the screen sharing privileges, Rebecca? Okay. It says that it's disabled. Hang on, let me fix that real quick. I know as panelists you should, but let me make sure that you do. And Paige, you can help with that too if you're on the, I think you're a co-host, I'm not sure, I'll double check. Um, Sorry about the delay. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm going to make you co host, Shakara. You got it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Looks great. Okay, wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> so thanks again for welcoming me here to this lecture series. I'm gonna be presenting on black agrarianism and inter environmental justice with an exploration of abolition and decolonization as theories and practices. So I'm going to start by sharing about who I am briefly and my journey into this work and some theoretical frameworks and community practices um, that, I that I have gravitated towards throughout my academic and just overall personal life journey. I will then go into a brief history and current description of Black agrarianism. I will move on to describe the connections between Black agrarianism and environmental justice and ending with some notes on abolition and decolonization within environmental justice. So there have been three main components that guide my work, Black agrarianism, food sovereignty, and environmental justice. And I started studying Black agrarianism as a grad student at Michigan State University in the Department of Community Sustainability. I worked with the Center for Regional Food Systems on various food systems projects that encompassed supporting Black farmers through technical assistance, farm to school, um, the Michigan Good Food Charter, things like that. 
And I've had the pleasure of working with Kyle White, who was who was then at Michigan State, um, and he was my dis my dissertation chair. And then I worked with him as a postdoc, researching Afro Indigenous ecologies as a way to unpack the solidarity and counter solidarity formations between Black and Indigenous people here on Turtle Island within the context of land justice and, and environmental justice. And so my studies overall have led me to build deep relationships within Black farmers, with Black farmers and agrarians more widely throughout certain parts of the South, the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest. I've traveled to Cuba and Puerto Rico to learn more about food sovereignty and agroecology movements led by peasant farmers there. And my relationships and experiences have led me to work with the Climate Justice Alliance on building out the intersections between food sovereignty and climate justice. My, and also, um, my relationships and experiences have led me to work on political education organizing with the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance and a number of national alliance formations such as the National Black and Food and Justice Alliance. I'm also a mother and I've been motivated to move beyond the intellectualism of this work into the more personal realm. I consider myself to be a farmer, not just a person that studies farmers or work with farmers, and I consider myself of course, to be an agrarian, among other titles. And I owe a lot to the grassroots communities doing the base building work of Black agrarianism, food sovereignty, and environmental justice, because I've learned more being in community with frontline folks than I have learned throughout my entire academic career. And so this presentation is a reflection of the intertwined community and academic work that I do now. So I wanna start with black feminism. Uh, black feminisms in particular have nurtured me intellectually, politically, emotionally, and in many other ways that other theories and practices did not. I found black feminisms through black agrarian organizing work and it along with black agrarian frameworks helped me identify my mothering as a source of political power and validated my spiritual connection to the scope of work that was imposed as a strictly intellectual process by the academy. So black feminisms to me are philosophies, ideologies, practices and frameworks for highlighting the distinct intersections of race, gender, class, sexuality, ability and their impact on black women's lives. And black feminisms challenge the ways institutions, policies, culture, and interpersonal relationships intersect and compound to uniquely and violently oppress black women. So it is through black feminisms for me that I understand blueprints emerge for how we build a non-capitalist, non-patriarchal, non-colonialist, non-racist world that is significantly contingent upon black agrarian and environmental justice movement building. Black agrarianism has also been a significant framework and practice that I have leaned on and has held me in its wings. And I would consider it to be a pedagogical thought, a praxis in a social movement. It reflects the fierce determination to define freedom in terms of agricultural self-sufficiency. To define, to define freedom in terms of agricultural self-sufficiency and the consciousness involved in achieving it. It highlights the connections between achieving social justice and environmental stewardship and the ancestral legacy of resistance. And as a food sovereignty praxis, it is an anti-oppression pedagogy that honors the ecological agency that has always been relevant to black experiences prior to what we would know based on what the literature would say, which comes, which really postulates a very deficit perspective of black people and agriculture and land generally. And black agrarianism as a social movement also intersects with other historical movements such as the social, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the black arts movement, the movement for black lives, and of course, environmental justice. So the environmental justice movement, as I'm sure many of you know, grew out of the historic civil rights movement as a response to the system of environmental racism, 
where communities of color and low-income communities have been and continue to be disproportionately exposed to and negatively impacted by hazardous pollution and industrial practices. And around the same time, Black farmers were also battling rapidly declining land loss during the civil rights era, which is usually considered to be a significant period of political, economic, and overall societal advancement for Black communities. And ironically, Black farmers continued to lose land rapidly during this time, while they continued to bolster the civil rights movement by using their land to bail activists out of jail and providing security and housing for food for traveling activists such as the Freedom Riders. So a lot can be gathered from understanding the Black agrarian movements fighting for economic and political autonomy through land ownership and environmental justice movements, also fighting for livable communities in part through community control of land and other tactics. So Black agrarianism and environmental justice have always has always been wedded through Black liberation organizing from the very beginning under the wings of the civil rights movement. For example, the first community land trusts in the US began with Black farmers in Georgia in 1969 as a way to stop foreclosures on poor rural farmers who, also, who were also targets for exploitative land developments, which environmental justice forces were also fighting. So these two communities came together, environmental justice and Black agrarianism, maybe unknowingly um, to, to pursue community land trusts as a strategic force and solution against these, these oppressive systems. And of course, these are not convenient coincidences. Rather, they are cosmic collaborations grounded in community self-determination. So how did we get here? This is a brief timeline of land dispossession and displacement. And I'll start with the Homestead Act in 1862, which accelerated Western migration by providing white settlers with 160 acres of public land. Of course, this is land that was stolen from indigenous peoples. And the act led to the distribution of 80 million acres of public land by 1900. In 1865, after meeting with freed Africans in Georgia, General William Sherman responded to their demands for land. In January, he issued the special field order 15 setting aside a huge swath of abandoned lands along the Atlantic coast, particularly Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida for black families. And in the same year, 40,000 freed Africans were settled on approximately 400,000 acres of land in that area. Later that summer, President Andrew Johnson reverses the policy and then orders the land to be returned to the Confederate planter oligarchy. And so this is where the, the 40 acres and a mule that never came comes from. In, eight, in 1865, Congress established the Freedmen's Bureau providing for the redistribution of abandoned or confiscated lands to freedmen up to 40 acres. And in reality, the Freedmen's Bureau never really had much control over the land in the South. It was pretty much an illusion. And the Bureau and the President Johnson's amnesty, a proclamation forced the, rest, the restoration of that land and Congress shut down the Freedmen's Bureau in 1872. And unlike white people that were given free land in the West, thanks to the 1862 Homestead Act, black people were need, needed to purchase their land after centuries of working the land essentially, for free essentially. And then white settlers, of course, received massive welfare subsidies under the Homestead Act than any other people throughout the 19th century. In 1866, the Southern Homestead Act opened up 46 million acres of public land in states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And severe opposition to Black land ownership in the South placed ob obstacles in the path of Black farmers at the state level. And then from 1950 to 1975, there was an 88% decline in Black land loss in most of the, in most of the Black South. And preceding that 1910 is when black farmers amassed most of the land that we ever had um, or black land owned throughout history. 
And so it, it's ironic that black people owned more land in 1910 than we do now. And so now in, two, in 2021, black farmers own less than 3 million acres, farm 4.5 million acres and comprise approximately 2% of all US farmers. So this historical trajectory has led us to the vastly inequitable landscape we have today. From 1910 to 2017, according to the Ag Census, there was an overall percentage loss of 96% of black farm operators compared to a 64% loss of white farm operators. And then by, by 1910, black people had acquired over 15 million acres of land, which was the height of black land ownership throughout history at, on this land mass in particular. And as I mentioned before, this indicates that we owned more land in 1910 than we do today. So from 1910 to 2017, there was an overall percentage loss of 74% of black farm acres compared to an almost 2% gain of white farm acres. So though our knowledge and labor built the foundation of American agriculture and beyond, we, we own very little resources as the statistics indicate. So this means agricultural production is disproportionately located in the hands of white people. On an even more detailed breakdown, uh, we see that many farmers of color comprise a very small part with white farmers dominating as the majority. And this is with, within the broader US landscape. According to the 2017 census, black farmers comprise 2% of American agriculture, own less than 3 million acres of farmland, and their average age is 61 years old. Majority of them make less than 1,000 a year. And this is a snapshot of farms in Michigan that is very similar to the national trend. However, on the state level, black farmers comprise less than other farming groups as seen in the 0% marker with white farmers comprising more of the total. So this is very similar to the, the total US trend as well. So these statistics reflect the strategically constructed plantation economy where white supremacy, racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, anti-blackness, settler colonialism, all, and all of the things that intersect together privilege white people and whiteness as a culture over everything else. So the plantation economy started with the theft of indigenous lands by Spanish settlers, the transference of, community, of communal lands and territory into private property to be worked by African people enslaved by the Spanish, the Dutch and the British turning sacred beings, being plants, animals and people into commodities through agricultural mass production. And within this system, people of color are the workers and white people are the owners of production. And so this is why we say the food system isn't broken. It's working exactly the way it was designed from, from the dawn of empire in the early 16th century. So we're dismantling the current food system that is deeply intertwined with the overall environmental system through community self-determination. This is what environmental justice and black agrarianism and food sovereignty and, and all of those practices and theories are about. So we use urban and rural agriculture as a tool in building community self-determination, which means having greater control over our lives, the food we eat, which can lead to greater control over other aspects of our lives. It's about being less dependent on the oppressive systems that exploit and extract from our communities and develop real realities that are dictated for us and by us. And we use community self-determination to dismantle the plantation economy, which means addressing the following, the violent removal of indigenous peoples from their sovereign lands, racialized chattel enslavement of Africans and the creation of a perpetual wage labor class, the construction of private property rights to shore up European hegemony and dominion over natural resources, which I would consider economic terrorism, the commodification of, of the natural world and theft and the monetization of traditional knowledge and ways of knowing, and the systemic exclusion and dispossession of Africans 
of our farmland and thus self-determination. So within this white supremacist, racial capitalist, heteropatriarchal settler nation, land has become the foundation of wealth, societal and political power, which makes land reclamation and land rematriation vital to environmental justice movements. So environmental justices, injustices started with manifest destiny in the transatlantic slave trade that birthed the diabolical strategies of empire, plantation or industrial agriculture predicated on the establishment of private property, racialized labor, soil degradation, sea commodification, urban ghettos, and the list goes on. Right, so the movements we fight against a white art, the movements fight back against a white terrorist system that protects power and property by preserving a culture of violence that began in the early 16th century with stolen land and stolen labor as its basis. So land in the Americas was always was categorized by the British crown as terra nullius, meaning nobody's, nobody's land, thereby discursively erasing indigenous peoples themselves and legally eliminating their claims to land and territory and indigenous people themselves were continually like literally made to disappear through displacement genocidal campaigns which were driven by white settler desires for land since colonization indigenous people's racialization has largely been geared toward disappearance which has been crucial for both the justification and the logics of white occupation of native land by contrast black people have historically been racialized as a hyper visible uh, community given our predominantly our predominant role as the labor force on the land. So there's a clear connection between ancestral land loss and being able to maintain one sense of self spirit and belonging. And this is a huge component of environmental justice that doesn't often get talked about. So black agrarianism addresses the, the black experience of living in the wake of enslavement and facilitates the process of helping black people fall back in love with the land after so many centuries of trauma with the land. And so this is an environmental justice issue because relegating land use, whether it's for ceremony, agricultural purposes, joyful recreation or anything else exclusively to white communities whom are considered to be the primary occupants of land for various uses further entrenches societal oppressions. So environmental justice has necessarily and always encompassed identity politics. They've uh, perhaps very implicitly or subtly, but it's always been present. So it's not just about fighting for cleaner air, cleaner water and cleaner soil and holding imperialist multinational corporate institutions accountable for environmental degradation. We have to also account for the colonial trauma that has led to the linking of land to social, economic, political, and cultural and spiritual death within black communities and communities of color more broadly. So reclaiming land as essential to the cultural and political identities beyond the colonial constructions of our identities is environmental justice. We directly contest the systems that relegate blackness as the fodder of the land. It, along with other processes, addresses the root of environmental injustices here on Turtle Island which is stolen land and stolen labor, which have dictated the, the structural schema of other intersecting injustices. So we, we believe that when we reclaim our indigenous identities, Afro-Indigenous identities, we reclaim our memories, our cultural practices, our experiences, such as how to keep seeds in the stories that come with them and how to fertilize soil without expensive and toxic chemicals of, from the agro-industrial complex how to intercrop specific plants to facilitate biodiversity and, and, e and overall ecosystem health and how to preserve foods to survive through the winter and so on. And a huge part of this process is, the, is revalorizing African mythology and, and ecological thought that revere the centrality, of, the, the centrality of nature, stories of trees, animals, birds, flora and natural elements all had their origins in preserving and conserving the fragile relationship between humans and our, and our natural environment. Rather than seeing ourselves as separate from nature, 
as theorized in Western cosmologies, we see ourselves as part of nature. So African ecological thought utilizes land as part of the ritual of, of how to honor spirit. These ritualistic expressions of an eco-spiritual worldview were imprinted on the daily lives of those enslaved Africans and impacted their beliefs about food, farming, family, and overall just living. So land has been the quintessential ingredient for maintaining these traditions. And so when we were torn from our homelands in Africa, it severely disrupted this entire uh, ritualistic tradition that we had to figure out how to regenerate when we were brought here um, involuntarily and then um, having to work around the various systems of oppression that not only kept us from the land um, to build up the wealth of the empire, but also um, use our labor in that building, ex excluding us from the wealth that we created ourselves. So what does this all have to do with abolition and decolonization? As powerful as land is, Black agrarianism on Turtle, on Turtle Island has to confront the indigeneity of the land, especially within the context of environmental justice. Historical and contemporary demands for 40 acres and a mule that comes from Black agrarian communities as minimal reparations is legitimate and it can still abandon the question from where the 40 acres originate. So black agrarian formations in our quest for land as power have to be cautious about perpetuating the indigenous erasure and further entrenching the settler colonial structure. So black people in the United States, of course, we know have been largely racialized through the social and economic institution of slavery, of enslavement, and through a stratified economic system that continue to extract labor from us in exploitative ways. And we also know that this black racialization existed in tandem with indigenous racialization, which gave European settlers the golden ticket to pillage the land and the racialized people who have continued to serve as the economic engine of the white wealth building. So solidarity formations that bring together abolition and decolonization gives our current movement the strategic force and the moral weight that it needs to actually dismantle these systems of oppression and not reform them. So I'm going to pause there and I'm hoping we could engage a bit and the chat function seems to be working. So I'm curious to know what you all think about decolonization and abolition, even if you haven't read a lot about it, what, what comes to mind when you hear those words? It could be a, a word, it can be a phrase, um, but, but just generally what's what's on your heart or what's on your mind um, when you hear those words. Okay, nice. Reparations, decolonization linked to the your time in the Peace Corps and post-colonial Africa, realizing independence is the beginning of the work and not the end, right? Accountability within community, recognizing the common root of domination, justice, back to humanity, right? Right, creating worlds where domination is impossible. Right, I would agree with all of these for sure. Ethic of care, thank you all. So let me pose another question. What do you think it will take for us to get to decolonial and abolitionist futures based on these phrases that are used to describe decolonization and abolition. Right, they're often conflated, for sure. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can spend some time teasing out how they're different and how they're related and how they can ultimately support one another and not detract from one another, as you say, Jessica, thank you. Physically given land back, right. So again, the question was, what do you think it's gonna take for us to get there? Given the, the entire historical trajectory that I've shared and things that I didn't share that you may know beyond this presentation, how do we get there? Okay, building collectives with settlers, teaching the history of colonization must be normalized. Got it, yeah. Right the wrongs that have been done, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely, on, we're on, we're all on similar vibrations, thank you. Right, I can't imagine the American empire giving itself up voluntarily either. And that's why actually I'm gonna go back in the presentation to the beginning. This, um, this is an Adankra symbol that comes out of the West African uh, Ghanaian symbology system. And the indigenous name is Akofina and it means swords of war. And this is why I would consider abolition and decolonization to be crimes against the, the violent settler system. Um, so yeah, we're at war, which is why I've chosen red as the black drop and I chose this symbol because the US will never voluntarily give up its position. So we must fight for it, we must take it back. And that's essentially an act of war. So thank you all. Uh, I actually, I think this is a really good place to plug in the first question we have in the Q&A of how does agricultural education fit into this narrative? So do you see educating folks on these topics as a potential source or a, a potential avenue to address these things that we're talking about? Do I see education as a, could you repeat that? As a tool for a addressing these issues. I think specifically to, we're talking about dominant agricultural education modes, right? As someone who's been at MSU and someone who's, you know, yeah, whether you have thoughts on, <laughs> on how agricultural education is reinforcing. Oh. Yeah, I education. see I see it now. Kisa just um, adjusted, I interpreted the question incorrectly. So how does it actually, how does agricultural education help create harm? If you'll see that in the Q&A. How does agricultural education actually create harm? And I'm, and I'm assuming that that's articulated within the traditional context of Exactly, exactly. Yeah, dominant educational practices. I guess you could think about the legacy of extension, science outreach, you know, all that, the weight of agricultural education. Right, okay, so Ironically, this was part of my dissertation, so I can share a little bit about the history of, of agricultural education here on Turtle Island. Um, so, it, so the extension system in particular started with Black agrarian formations, particularly George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University in the early 1900s. And he saw the need to, so basically George Washington Carver arrived in the South and saw the need to help farmers save the soil because they were losing massive amounts of topsoil through, the, through industrial ag processes. And of course, this um, devastated Black rural communities I and mean, rural communities generally, but of course, Black rural communities that tend to be further suppressed within the system due to lack of resources, systemic racism and all of these things. And so he started um, traveling the countryside with a wagon and some, and some um, tools to teach farmers one-on-one, face-to-face, -on -one, -face, hands-on practices about how to build soil health. He came to them, he, um, 
assured them that he was someone that they could trust. And he started from their lived experience you know, talking about their history as black people on the land and talking about the, the Afro-Indigenous traditions that were used back home on the continent in Africa, et cetera. And so he, what I would consider reinvigorated this ancestral memory as, a, as the foundation of the, edu of the educational process. And he started from where they are and, and not assuming that they would come to the university and just be filled up with information um, what Paulo Freire calls the banking system of information, just just constantly pouring uh, pouring knowledge or information into students' minds and expecting them to regurgitate it, and then everything is okay, right? And so, agricultural education, with that origin framework, has always been somewhat radical because it started with the farmers that were doing the work of feeding the nation basically. And so I think traditional education or as it has evolved to now, um, <laughs> it's complicated because of course we live in a very westernized system and our educational systems where we're expected to memorize and regurgitate ma massive amounts of information that are not connected to our lived realities, that are not connected to our ancestral cosmologies, our ways of knowing, our, our epistemologies, and the methodologies that we tend to use in our everyday lives um, causes us to be very disconnected from what we're learning and what we're doing and, and, and how that impacts the, the world that we need to build to um, literally survive, right? And so I think um, the more, tr to answer the question, and I hope I'm on the right path, um, traditional educational methods really do a disservice to the, the innate power that each one of us has as spiritual beings in, in this world um, to, to it, it, it really subtracts from our ability to tap into our ancestral knowledge and then move from there, right? And to reduce the world that we need just by the, 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 the basic ingredients of our memories, the basic ingredients of our feelings, everything is um, about what we think, right? So the Cartesian uh, ideology around um, the mind body split Right, I think, therefore I am, um, which is highly problematic. And to counter that, Audre Lorde, who's one of my favorite black feminist authors, queer black feminist author says, I feel, therefore I can be free. And so traditional agricultural knowledge or education doesn't account for the affect, the feeling and how people um, tend to feel in these very stale educational environments that doesn't invigorate the head, heart, and the hands together. It just invigorates the mind. It becomes an overly intellectual process. There's a lot more I can say about it. I don't wanna to continue to rant on. I know we have more questions and I do have a few more slides that I wanna to get to. So I'm gonna continue on and then we can address the, more, uh, the other questions later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Audre Lorde's poem is is phenomenal. Well, all of her poems are phenomenal, but that one in particular is phenomenal. Thanks for sharing that. So a few notes on decolonization. These are my few, these are my two favorite quotes, or one of my two favorite quotes of decolonization. And I actually began to learn about decolonization as a framework um, through various courses I was taking at Michigan State um, with Kyle White and with y Yamada Figueroa. And it really, it rocked my whole world because being in the department that I was in that, that was very sort of technical on, on agriculture and agroecology and, and, and what that meant for broader realities, it didn't, it, it didn't say anything about how our natural environment has been colonized and what decolonization means broadly. And so uh, Franz Fanon is one of, uh, my, one of my favorite decolonial authors. And he says that decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world 
is obviously a program of complete disorder, but it cannot come as a result of magical practices, nor of a natural shock, nor of a friendly understanding. Decolonization as we know it is a historical process that is to say it cannot be understood, it cannot become intelligible nor clear to itself except in the exact measure that we can discern the movements which give it historical form and content. So I know that's a, a huge mouthful. And what I take away from this quote is the, the historical trajectory that decolonization has to be grounded in, which I spent, why, which is why I spent so much time outlining the, the historical process that has led us to where we are today. Why are there so many wealth inequities that exist today, right? Because of the way land was stolen, labor was stolen at the dawn of empire and et cetera. And so we have to account for those things within environmental justice processes. We can't just say that, um, well, let's just start in the 1960s at the supposed dawn of the environmental justice movement and, and use that as the foundation to move forward. Well, I think we have to go all the way back as far back as possible to, under, to fully understand the whole scenario, right? And another important quote is from Tuck and Yang in their 2012 article, Decolonization is not, a, is not a Metaphor. And this is probably the most important component that I, that I want you all to understand. Decolonization is accountable to indigenous sovereignty and futurity. So decolonization cannot be a metaphor. We often say that we have to decolonize our food system. We have to decolonize our curriculum and our campuses. We have to decolonize ourselves. And so the way it's been co-opted and um, maybe culturally appropriated to and use as a proxy for other mechanisms or for other means is, is very problematic because it contributes to the indigenous erasure. And so de decolonization first and foremost has to be accountable to indigenous people, right? And the giving back of land. So now moving on to abolition. Um, the essence of abolitionism is the construction of a society without imprisonment and policing. And this comes from the, the study group guide, if you're new to abolition, which I, I highly recommend, very readable. And the Movement for Black Lives very succinctly says an affirm, affirmation or abolition is an affirmation of black life, right? And so we can't talk about black life, black joy, black love without accounting for the horrible system of enslavement, right? And so Abolition and decolonization are not one and the same. Um, and I actually think they go hand in hand while they're not the same, they complement one another because they both address two of the quintessential ingredients in the building of empire that I mentioned before, stolen land and stolen labor. And so this is why the solidarity formations between black and indigenous peoples are so critical because we can't divorce the stolen land and stolen labor um, scenario because those two things have been the critical ingredients to how society has been structured today, right? And so environmental justice to me is essentially about preserving black life or reinvigorating black life, um, appreciating blackness and also returning land to indigenous peoples, affirming indigenous sovereignty, affirming indigenous resurgence and everything that comes with that. And to further go with decolonization is not a metaphor, Tuck and Yang say until stolen land is returned, critical consciousness does not translate into action that disrupts settler colonialism. So again, we can say that we want a better reality. We feel good when we use these radical frameworks, when we publish, when we give presentations, maybe even attend a protest in solidarity. But until land is rematriated to indigenous peoples, we are still not in a decolonial framework. We are not fully living out decolonization. And to complement this, the decolonization frame, Mary Hooks from um, the Black Lives Matter chapter in Atlanta says that the mandate for black people in this time is to avenge the suffering of our ancestors 
to earn the respect of future generations and to be willing to be transformed in the service of the work. And this in essence is abolition. And so I think these two go together quite well because again, <laughs> stolen land and stolen labor are the foundation. And so we have to heal, we have to return land, we have to return, um, return the economic cost or the, the economic debt that we owe to black people through reparations and other means, right? And so um, let's be clear on like what transformation is and what reformist is. So working towards radical imagination, I just wanna leave us with some reflective questions based on abolition and decolonization and the, the history that I shared from my perspective. Imagine if white people didn't comprise 94% of farm operators and 98% of land owned in the US currently, would we need environmental justice, social movements, would Western labeling of natural resources be more democratized? What would be the ecological state of our planet? How would this state influence other sectors, economic, politic, political, et cetera? What role would identity politics play and how would we coexist together? So, you know, that I think reenacting or reinvigorating, reinvigorating our radical imaginations is, is so important to this work because um, like James Baldwin says, the least we can demand is the impossible. If we're always considering um, these very surface level solutions, then we're, we're dishonoring um, the, the blood, sweat and tears of our ancestors that have got us here and the potential for us to grow beyond these systems of oppression that we fight against. So I'll end there and I'm, in, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, uh, wow, those are really excellent questions to leave us with. Definitely a lot to think about, a lot of food for thought. Um, so I really appreciate you leaving us with that. Um, so I'm going to, first off, thank you so much for your work that addresses food justice and food sovereignty. It's truly inspiring us for students, um, especially the way you incorporate race, class, and gender is particularly inspiring. Um, a lot of us here at SEAS are definitely community advocates, so it's great to hear your work on that. Um, I would also like to say thank you so much for speaking. You're our first speaker in our lunchtime lecture series. So what a great kickoff. Absolutely incredible. We had a side chat going in our individual class. You know, this is fire. So absolutely wonderful. Um, so thank you. And we'd also like to thank you for your good continued research and equally importantly, your presence as an active participant in the domains and organizations that you study. I think it's really unique that you're studying and working within these spaces. So um, I do have class at one o'clock, so I'll go ahead and pass the torch on to Tori, who will open up the Q&A with a few questions. So before I head out, I want to thank you again for your awesome contribution. Thank you, Paige. It was great to meet you. You as well. All right. Hi, all. I'm going to break out into our Q&A section briefly. I also want to thank Dr. Tyler for talking about these um, these experiences. Um, your work specifically addresses the relationship between Black agrarianism, environmental justice, and Indigenous people's fight for sovereignty. We are so interested in hearing more about the theoretical and practical aspects of this interface in terms of finding social and institutional common ground where people can work together. Our first question is, in what ways have these movements combined? What channels of communication are used? And are there any events where people share their thoughts or experiences across these movement spaces. We are particularly interested in how these um, conversations create aligned policy decisions or demands um, coming out of those relationships. And I will be dropping that into the chat. We also had a question about um, your work with the Michigan Emerging, Emerging Farmers Matching Funds Program on how it's going, how it went, if it's still continuing, and if you had any feedback or changes and improvements for the program that might be useful for other programs. And lastly, we wanted to know if you have any advice for us graduate students on how to make these realistic or changes within our own communities. And I'll be dropping all these in the chat. Thank you. 
Thanks, Victoria. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to remember <laughs> all of those questions as you're typing them into the chat. So I'll start with the last one. Um, being a grad student and wanting to influence change is obviously re really, really wonderful and, and needed. And I, I remember feeling that way and like feeling very disconnected from community in grad school because I was sick of everything coming from a book or an article. Um, and so I really got my hands in the soil. That was my solution to be more connected to the earth and to, and to do what I felt that I needed to do, not just what my mind was telling me to do, but literally my body drew me to the land. And so that's what I did. And I think it's also important to, um, to really understand what role we play reg regardless of your identity, your cultural identity, your racial identity, gender, et cetera. Um, I think that the, the go-to term is to be an ally and that can become really problematic within the ally industrial complex, <laughs> given that many of our academic careers are predicated on studying, teaching, writing, publishing about the issues that we say that we're fighting against. Um, and we're not working ourselves out of a job, right? And so we, we are invested in the problematic context because it gives us fuel to get paid an academic salary, right? <laughs> and, to, and to continue to be the sort of gatekeeper of the knowledge within academic institutions. And that's highly problematic. So although we say that we're an ally, we're actually contributing and further entrenching these systems of oppression, right? And so I really appreciate this courses that I've learned from community members who have held me and said, hey, what you're doing is great, but let's be real about what the real work is about. So they said, you must become an accomplice with us, not an ally. Being an accomplice means that you are contributing to the criminal the criminal act of overthrowing the system. You are investing you your your academic career, your um, academic salary, all of the papers you've published, whatever academic clout you have. You are basically risking that for the sake of building the world that we need, right? And so, basically, whose side are you on? If you're neutral, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. And so an accomplice indicates the, the criminality that's immediately imposed on you um, by aligning with the, the quote unquote underside of history, right? The people that are doing the work, fighting against um, the academic industrial complex, the nonprofit industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, and I'll yeah, I'll leave it there. And then the other question was the Michigan Emerging Farmers Matching Funds program, right? So that was actually a very temporary program under the beginning farmer rancher development grant that the Center for Regional Food Systems had. Um, and act, and so I can give some basic feedback on how that went. It was it was really helpful to re, to be able to provide financial capital to beginning farmers in the state of Michigan that needed it. And I will say that one one of the key takeaways that we learned from that program is the again the vast wealth inequities that exist within the Michigan beginning farmer community. So it's one thing to give out grants to people who have the time and the energy to complete the paperwork to do it, right? And so there was a whole entire process <laughs> um, to distribute the funds. And of course, majority of those recipients were white beginning farmers, right? Because they had the know-how to complete the paperwork. They had the know-how to attain the resources they, they had the resources to demonstrate a savings account, which is a prerequisite for the program. And so when we come up with these food justice or food sovereignty solutions, whether it's providing more financial capital to farmers or what have you, we really have to address the, the, the basic foundation of why inequity exists, right? And so more people have access to technology to complete the, the paperwork than others. More people have access 
to the financial capital needed to provide collateral or whatever, whatever, to get more money. And so, yeah, I think we really have to do the hard work of, of building up the wealth of people of color, just to be very frank, so they can equitably, equitably participate in the market. Um, so it levels the playing field, basically. Um, and so moving on to the next question, in what ways have movements combined? What channels of communication are used in events where people share their thoughts and experiences? Uh, right, and I think that specifically with in mind the, <clears throat> the questions of black agrarianisms and indigenous sovereignties and how they're intersecting, how you see that sh you know, taking shape in this moment or historically over the course of your work. Right. Um, that's a it's a big question. It is. So I'm <laughs> I'm organizing. And, I, and I'll I'll just help out a little by saying we had a, a wonderful uh, journalism fellow, Liana Hosea, who came to Michigan for a year and stayed on in our school as an environmental media fellow. She was making an independent documentary about water women and water rights, um, and she ended up traveling out to Standing Rock with um, Nayira and some of the key you know. Uh, activists out of Black Flint to meet <clears throat> leaders from Navajo Nation and other groups in Standing Rock around water. This whole idea that, you know, we are in this sort of new moment where land and water and energy, you know, food, these things are um, emerging, sovereignty and justice, <clears throat> revolutionary issues in so many places, but the, there aren't conferences in five-star hotels about it right? So what are those spaces? Like, how are those, how do we see that beginning to happen? How can we support that happening without being allies, but rather accomplices and all that? So yeah, just any, any descriptive thoughts about what you see there or have experienced there would be great. Turtle Island, clearly one interesting place to think with. Right. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Rebecca. So what comes to mind is the, the organic spaces that are, are really the heart of the work. So when I say like these really informal organic spaces where people are, are cooking together, people are planting seeds on the farm together, it's not this overly structured meeting space in an academic setting or even in a maybe philanthropic setting or what have you. Um, it's literally when, you know, people come together for a retreat, a weekend retreat, and everyone is fitting into the house, sleeping on the floor, sleeping on the stairs, cooking together, staying up all night, talking, sharing stories, playing music together, like those really um, open spaces where life can take form without this academic structured agenda is really where the magic happens in my experience. Um, and so, and actually these spaces have nurtured me and, and given me the, um, the motivation to learn about these theories and these practices around abolition and decolonization and black agrarianism, et cetera. Um, it's, it spoke life into these really stale frameworks that I was just reading about, but, in, and I was able to hear the stories from elders and stories from people that have been doing this work for a lot longer than I have. And I've learned tremendously from those, from those stories. And so like how we exchange information and how we build relationships in those spaces just by cooking a meal together or by uh, canning together fertilizing the soil, weeding out a community garden together um, is, is, is really fruitful. And I think we, it's sad that we can't make more time for that because life is what is what it is. And, you know, productivity is imposed and imposed on us <laughs> because of capitalism. And so it's hard to make time just for general connections to have conversations, to tell stories. Um, but yeah, I, I would say definitely prioritizing the emerging organic spaces for sure. And not just like academic settings, workshops, meetings um, with highly structured agendas that are very surface level, right? Um, 
That's just such a beautiful answer. And um, it reminds me of a few of the folks, Joe Trumpy included, although people are having to go teach, but David Michener, um, people who are kind of uh, almost subversively creating room for that within academic structures and on academic land um, <laughs> by inviting partners in to plant together, according to Richard, you know, like that. I think it's something that, um, yeah, is, is really interesting to think about in terms of how do you, how do you carve that out of these managed landscapes and create space for those kinds of connections for learners that can take them beyond the confines of a formal curriculum or a formal campus into shared experience of the kind Joe Trumpy mentioned in his intro, kind of, you know, it's just to let, yeah, and it's not magic. Fanon, you know, is absolutely right. It's, it's work and it's contingent, but I think that's just an amazing answer. I wanted to just um, acknowledge that Tori's going to have to hop off soon too. Tori, did you want to, uh, we do have one question in the Q&A from Jordan, um, which is kind of an uh, amazingly rich question to think with. Um, before we go, perhaps I'll, this could be our last question, I think, which is about um, having you speak a little more toward the tensions between land reclamation through private land ownership, potentially in part through reparations, and then the decolonizing vision of healthy and ethical agrarianism. Are we working toward a, a vision of a world without land ownership? So that let's let that question hang for just a moment in our minds while Tori, quickly before you go, maybe you could read that draft of a land acknowledgement that we created as students and raise your questions and you're wrestling with it. Because I think the question that Jordan's asking and the work of doing land acknowledgements in these academic settings are kind of interestingly entangled, right? So why don't you go ahead, Tori, before you have to go and read what you had and tell us your thoughts on that. Yes, uh, thank you. So this is our first draft of our land acknowledgement uh, used in this class. We spent some time before we started this uh, going through it and discussing what kind of language we wanted to use. And it is very much work in progress and we're very happy to share with you what we have so far. So we acknowledge and recognize that the land in this region of Michigan was originally known as Michigame and is the ancestral land of the Wyandot and Anishinaabeke people also known as the peoples of three fire, Ojibwa, Ottawa and Potawatomi. Since the attempted forced removal of Native American people and communities from this region, their historical ties to the land and to the origins of the university have been obscured and forgotten. With this statement, we acknowledge and reaffirm those ties. We are honored to be guests of this land. And one question that came up during our, um, our review of this is, are we actually honored guests or are we trespassers? And I don't know if we have a for sure answer for that, but it's definitely a question we are also thinking about during this time that connects to uh, Jordan's question as well. Right, yeah, this is a really, really great question. Thanks for bringing this up. And there's no easy answer. I definitely don't have the answer. We, I think we could we could reflect and, you know, I, I could pontif pontificate and, and interpret from what the little that I know because I'm I, I consider myself a baby and and you know pr pursuing what this all looks like um I still have a lot more to learn and but I will say that land ownership we know is 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 a western construction right coming out of European feudalism and all of these things and um Yes, there is no way forward if we continue to use the system of private land ownership. There is no way forward to decolonization and abolition. And at the same time, since we have to survive in the system while we dismantle it, um, land ownership is a solution, not only in Black communities, but other um, poor or impoverished communities of color because we have to we have to have a stake in the wealth complex right like in the, and land means wealth land means power and so um what so one solution and I'll just go into some strategies that folks have been using around navigating these these complexities and these um, apparent contradictions 
Um, one is uh, the cultural conservation easement that I learned from the cultural respect easement that I learned from Soul Fire Farm, Leah Penniman's um, food sovereignty work in upstate New York and her work with the Mohican people around developing a cultural respect easement where Black and Indigenous peoples, the Black people that own the land are in consistent conversations with the Indigenous peoples of those lands traditionally and um, leaving the door open for whatever collaborations emerge, right? And, and also advocating on their behalf for land to be returned to them, even as the Black people in the area own the land. Um, and that's the extent to what that I know about it. Um, and I think Leah Penniman is open to discussions if you would like to learn more. Another example is a land tax that I learned about in California. It's called the Shumi land tax. And, and so people that own a certain amount of land in that area would pay a land tax to the indigenous peoples that traditionally have, been, have inhabited that area as a way to honor their presence and as a way to um, build up their or contribute to their economic well-being, being as though um, the, the economic state of indigenous peoples, of course, in this country is not at all what it should be, given that these are their lands, right? And so those two strategies I've been really holding on to as, as like feasible ways forward. Um, and as beginning steps to decolonize and live in right in a better right relationship with our with indigenous kin, right, our indigenous kin, indigenous people, um, and also I I, I want to go back to how we talk about our our ind individual connections to land, right? Because that's really important. Black people have confused what happened on the land with the land itself, along with other people of color, um, perhaps indigenous peoples as well. And so our personal intimate relationships with the land is important as well. And so it's not just about the, the capitalist structure of land ownership, but it's also about how are we intimately relating to land that has been commodified into this resource, but is actually a sacred being that that has been calling out to us to connect ever since you know the beginning of time. So yeah, I don't I don't want that to get lost in the shuffle because we we tend to just talk about the economic and political parts of of what decolonization, environmental justice, and food sovereignty and all these things mean, without talking about our personal sense of belonging and our emotional connection to our mother, the land, which is really essential. Out in there. Um, Tori, head out if you need to, and um, I'll just close out this this group um, and the recording itself for those who weren't able to be with us today. Thank you so much for your work um, to welcome Dr. Tyler Tori. Uh, you and Paige have been wonderful moderators and synthesizers of your <clears throat> student voice, you know, questions. Appreciate it. Um, and I, I do think that the note we're ending on is a great setup for the fact that we will have uh, Texas A&M Prof. Thomas Mitchell, MacArthur Genius, who has had, who has been, I think, only the second African American in the history of this country to sit on our federal partitions. You know, there, there, there's a lot of work he's been doing on partition law and property law to stem the tide of loss of black landowners title to land in rural U.S. states, notably Wisconsin, Texas. So I think that, that you know, this, this frame of the measured but effective strategies like the tax in California or the easements in upstate New York, you know, that we can use consciously as we're surviving during the work of dismantling is going to be a perfect uh, kind of frame with which we can, I hope all of us, many of us, join Thomas next week to basically continue these conversations with a different mind at work. And I am really looking forward to that, Shakara. Uh, I hope Dr. Tyler will, will join us again if time permits. Um, if not, obviously we'll share the recording with you. And, and this is a standing conversation now that we're creating as a community and that we so hope um, that many of you will continue to join us in to think with and to give ourselves that energy for the work we're doing week to week. We know it's, it's hard. It's hard work. Tori, did you want to say any last words? 
I just wanted to thank you again for your time and for sharing your knowledges and experiences with us. Um, I, for one, have learned a lot and I'm sure that everyone here can say the same thing. Um, and I hope to see you again in our future meetings. Thanks all. I really appreciate the conversation and I've learned a lot as well. So deeply appreciative. Wonderful. I'll switch off the recording, but stay online for just a moment in case there are any loose ends we want to talk about. Thanks everyone for your energies today. The chat has been so much fun. And I, I do think we hit that conviviality mark, even as we heard from a very intellectually and ideologically take no prisoners perspective, which is, you know, that's a hard combination to hit, to be warm and and embracing of one another, even as we are um, acknowledging how high stakes and hard um, this work is and will be. So thank you for that, Dr. Tyler. And with that, I'll close out the recording. Thanks, folks. Awesome.